Hey, hey everyone, it's your Peacekeeper, and it's time for the next video in our How to Play series on the Japanese cruiser line. This is the Tier 9 Ibiki class of cruisers. The Ibiki class of cruisers were a class of two planned but none completed heavy cruisers built for the Japanese Navy during World War II. The two ships were laid down in 1942, however, um, Ibiki was the only one that actually received a name. The other one was whole number 301, and it was never given a name because it was scrapped a month after being laid down to make way for the carrier Amagi in, their, in the same slipway. The Ibiki class cruisers, due to lack of funding and time, were basically a repeat of the preceding Mogami class of cruisers. These ships would have launched in the form that Mogami and her sisters were as heavy cruisers. So rather than having the 155 millimeter guns, they would have launched with the 20.3 centimeter guns. They also launched with quad torpedo launchers instead of triple launchers. They had radar, hydrophones, and considerable anti-aircraft armament. Now, one quick little deviation here. Uh, In-game, we can see that uh, Ibuki has the 100mm guns. These would have actually not been on board this ship. It would have been the same 127mm guns that were on Mogami. In terms of service history, uh, number 301 was never near completion, and Ibuki was completed to approximately 80%. But not as a heavy cruiser. <laughs> she was converted to a light carrier when basically was finished when the war ended. But uh, because the war ended, she would not ever see any combat. And she would be scrapped in 1946 after the war. In terms of their in-game playstyle, Ibiki bears a remarkable resemblance to Mogami for obvious reasons. And yet... The two ships play very differently. While Ibuki retains the same soft armor, has 100 less hit points, and that massive above-water citadel, the addition of a heel and much better gun arcs makes the ships a little bit more durable and certainly more survivable. Now, how much so? It's really not a huge change. Uh, it's noticeable enough from, you know, the captain's seat, but when it comes down to it neither ship is going to be able to sit there and bow tank enemy incoming shells and at tier 9 she basically only faces up against ships that have 16 inch and above guns of course the exception being the rare case she sees tier 8s in a fight in which case she could then also see 15 inch guns however she does gain 8 0.8 kilometers in range, so almost a full kilometer in range, a half knot in speed, better torpedo arcs, and still has really good concealment, enough that she can stealth torpedo in a full stealth build. In spite of all this, the ship is still f not that easy to play. Um, it's more comfortable than Mogami was, but that's not saying much. I mean, that that's, Mogami is so frustrating to play on open maps like, uh, well, heck, Ocean. I managed to get into a game with the ship in Ocean. And while extremely rare to get on that map, you can pretty much guarantee that that was not a good match. And overall, you know, my impression of the ship is for a Tier 9, it's pretty dang average. I mean, there's nothing about the ship that is overly overwhelmingly amazing that I just feel the need to point out. Yes, it, it has very high fire chance. Yes, it has pretty usable range. However, I just I'm just not a fan. I just don't I don't know what to tell you. Not not my favorite ship in the line at all. Let's go over some stats, shall we? She has 39,000 hit points again. This is 100 less than Mogami. Uh, same armor profile, basically, uh, up to 140 millimeters. It's going to be over the magazines and then 100 over the machinery space, as you can see. It is above water. It also has this stupid, annoying step right here, which is just a giant Citadel Me magnet. And yes, any shell that hits this that has enough pen, if it falls at the right angle, is going to get a Citadel hit. That means that this ship can only effectively angle... At closer ranges, I mean, 32 millimeters of deck, but anything that hits in the front or back here in the rear 
it's going to go through and it only has to fall. You can see the angle it has to fall to hit that vertical plane. I mean, it pretty much guaranteed any shells that land in the back or the front of the ship could possibly find their way into your Citadel. Kind of frustrating in that regard. It does have a torpedo damage reduction of 16%, which for a cruiser is pretty impressive, but overall is not that much. The main battery consists of five twin 203mm or 8-inch 50 caliber guns. They have a 19.2 kilometer main battery firing range. However, that's going to be with the range extender. I think it's about 16.8 is where it comes out to be without, or 16.5. Uh, where it comes out without that, if you choose a different module in that slot, and we'll talk about that in a minute. They have a 15 second reload time, 26.9 second traverse time, which is really quite good, especially for, uh, you know, a Japanese cruiser, for anything Japanese, the pretty, pretty speedy turret traverse. You can actually turn with this ship and the guns will stay on target. Only thing that's impacting that is expert marksman on the captain. Uh, the sec secondary battery, again, it does have these four dual 100mm guns. They do serve as part of your anti-aircraft suite as well. 2.7 second reload time, 7% fire chance, but only 1,700 damage. So they're not doing a whole lot of damage when you do get in range with them. They have a 5.5 kilometer range. Not too shabby, but if you're that close to enemy ships, it's probably going to end poorly for you, especially if they know the difference between HE and AP. Torpedo tube, she has four quad launchers. They are mounted in the same location as Mogami, except for they have slightly better firing arcs. They can fire like 10 degrees further forward, which really doesn't impact their use at all. <laughs> 10 kilometer range, 67 knot speed, 21,000 damage, basically 1.7 kilometer spotting distance. In terms of anti-aircraft defense, she has 25, uh, sorry, 28 25 millimeter uh, those are going to be single mounts. She has six triple 25 millimeter mounts, six dual 40 millimeter Bofors mounts. And yes, those are Bofors. Look at them. And then, of course, those 100 millimeter gun mounts. Now, your AA bubble on this ship, your AA is quite respectable. Starts out at five kilometers, jumps down to 3.5, then 3.1. And in full AA spec, there's actually a pretty healthy amount of damage per second here. Uh, in order to get the most out of the anti-aircraft suite, though, you're probably going to want to get manual fire control for AA to double the DPS of those 100 millimeter gun mounts. That's really where the bulk of the damage is going to come from. You can see here, I mean, yeah, well, it ends up being basically dead heat between the 25 millimeters at 3.1 kilometers and the 100 millimeters. In terms of maneuverability, 35 knot top speed, 770 meter turning circle radius, 5.8 second rudder shift time, and that's going to be with the first rudder shift module. 9.7 kilometer detection range by sea with concealment expert on the captain and the concealment module on the upgrade slot. 6.8 kilometers by air and assured acquisition is 2 kilometers, which means if you're behind an island or in smoke, 2 kilometers is what you get spotted at. Let's talk about some upgrades. In the first upgrade slot, finally going to recommend Auxiliary Armaments Mod 1 to increase the survivability of your anti-aircraft suite. Now, the, you know, secondaries, well, you only have those 4-inch uh, gun mounts, the 100 millimeters. Not really a reason to choose this, but the AA gun mounts definitely are important part of this ship's capabilities. A main Armaments Mod 1... That's another honorable mention here. Uh, main battery doesn't get taken out too frequently, but it is noticeable enough that I could definitely see a good case being made for it. In the second slot, I'm using Aiming Systems Mod 1 for the dispersion reduction on the main battery of 7% and to increase the torpedo tube traverse speed by 20%. Don't really care about the secondary battery getting pushed out another 5% and decreasing its dispersion by 5%. Not really worth the reason why I chose this upgrade. Honorable mention to AA Guns Mod 2. If you're going to be specking the ship into an AA role, I highly recommend taking it. With the Fast Turret Traverse, Main Battery Mod 2 is not necessary, and Secondary Battery Mod 2 is really quite wasted because of the really bad secondaries. In the third slot, there's going to be two 
three, we'll, we'll say three options that I'm going to recommend. Now, I've chosen Gunfire Control System Mod 2. That's going to add 16% to the range. That bumps it out to that 19.2 kilometer range. And this just makes the ship a little bit more comfortable. You can engage ships at range. It gives you plenty of time to, to at least mitigate the incoming shell damage with a high probability of actually avoiding it altogether. And long-range HE spam is pro by far one of the most annoying things on battleships. So that's why I've chosen this. I can see an honorable mention being made to main battery mod 3. Losing a little bit of traverse speed on this, uh, slowing down your turrets really doesn't hurt as much, but gaining that reload time, that definitely could be advantageous. I didn't really play around with this at all during uh, my playthrough of Ibuki, but uh, I, I'm just not comfortable with this ship at close range. To me, it's like playing Des Moines at super close ranges with the reload module. I just, I get the reasons why people do it. I'm just not comfortable with it. The other honorable mention here is going to be AA Guns Mod 3. That's going to add 25% to the damage per second of all of your anti-aircraft gun mounts. So again, if you're going to spec the ship into AA, that's pretty much a necessary modification. Secondary Battery Mod 3, we don't need anything for the secondaries because they are garbage. And Torpedo Tubes Mod 3, well, the torpedoes are also... The torpedoes themselves are fantastic. The torpedo arcs are garbage, and getting into range to use them and then surviving the turn to use them, almost impossible. I would highly recommend basically ignoring the fact that you have torpedoes, unless you are just absolutely adamant about going back to port right now, because it's a surefire way to get yourself deleted. In the fourth slot, I'm sticking with Propulsion Systems Mod 1 for the 20% reduction in the chance of your engine becoming incapacitated, as well as decreasing the time it takes to repair it. Honorable mention here to Steering Gears Mod 1, which is the same thing for your steering gears. Honestly, uh, pick one. I personally find losing propulsion to be a bigger detriment than losing steering. This ship never really seemed to lose either with any regularity. So, I don't know. I, me personally, uh, Propulsion Mod 1, just better peace of mind overall. And thankfully, because it's a cruiser, even if you do lose the other it's probably going to be repaired fairly quickly. No point in running damage control systems mod one, simply because if you are on fire or you are getting hit by torpedoes, it's pretty much a death knell. That's going to be ringing your death. Or you better hope that your damage control party is up. In the fifth slot, I've got myself kitted up with steering gears mod two for the 20% reduction in rudder shift time. Again, this just goes back to the fact that I always play my, my cruisers on the move. I don't particularly care to sit behind islands. I think the play style is boring. I also find it to be increasingly frustrating, and this ship doesn't really seem to be able to angle to mitigate incoming damage at all. So it, it, the ship really doesn't lend itself very well to it. It is a viable play style for those who like to play that way, but I'd much rather be on the move. So for me, 20% reduction in rudder shift time is absolutely important. For those that do like to camp behind islands, I highly recommend Propulsion Mod 2 for the 50% reduction in the time it takes to reach full power when accelerating, as well as increasing engine power when the ship starts moving. Again, that's only going to be in that negative 6 to 6 knot range. It doesn't really play out at any other speeds. In the last and final slot, I am running Concealment Systems Mod 1. This is going to drop my detection range down to that 9.7 kilometers. And it also increases the dispersion of shells fired at me by 5%. Combine that with some camo and you can make some pretty big changes to an enemy ship's accuracy. You can pretty much negate any accuracy modules a battleship would take with those two upgrades. Well, this upgrade in the camo. Uh, honorable mention here to Steering Gears Mod 3. If you are running Propulsion Systems Mod 2 in the previous slot, I would definitely recommend at least picking this up Again, just a little bit more comfortable. I can see somebody making pretty good use of, of the, the stock rudder shift time. You know, it's in that 7.6, 7, 8 second range. Uh, overall, though, I personally find um, the more agile a ship is, the better I tend to play it. Target Acquisition Systems Mod 1. Uh, you know, I'm just, I'm not really sure that this plays a huge role in this in on cruisers. I suppose if you're going to be a destroyer hunter, which this ship doesn't do a particularly good job of because of the gun arcs, the rate of fire, I I, I don't see this as being a viable option. Uh, 
I'm sure somebody will let me know down in the comments. If you do, you know, run it and let me know down in the comments. Okay, so that's kind of the ship and its upgrades. Uh, in terms of consumables, we do get that heal. Definitely remember to throw on the flag for it if you've got them, which is going to be the India Delta flags for the 20% increase in what can be repaired. And then uh, we, we also have that choice between defensive fire and hydro. Of the two, I'm finding defensive fire to be a little bit more... It, it's hit or miss. It depends on when you play. If you're playing during the, the, the main hours, you might see a lot of tier 8 carriers in the queue. That could definitely be of use. If you're not, Hydroacoustic Search would be the one I would choose. Anyway, let's go look at this ship in a battle video. Alright, so this battle is going to be a tier 9 fight. So you can see we do have tier 7 carriers in the match. Yay, we're, we're in a legit match. The map is Land of Fire, and we are spawning all the way over on what I would call the C side of the map. If you are playing this on the standard battle, or sorry, domination mode with the three cap points, this is the C cap on the east side, B cap in the middle, A on the west. And this is actually not a bad place to start off and be in this ship because the islands allow you a certain degree of hard cover to one break line of sight and two to, you know, hide behind if that's your play style. B, it, <laughs> B can be a little uh, hairy depending on how your team plays it out if you don't have a destroyer that's willing to... Uh, give you smoke that could definitely cause some problems so right off the bat we're going to show you what those gun arcs are going to look like in those torpedo arcs overall the gun arcs are actually pretty solid i, I really can't complain too much about it um you can see they're pretty far forward give it one second here and i'll get a little bit more direct <laughs> show okay so here we go so you can see there we go that's the the gun arcs not too shabby in my opinion and we'll get the torpedo arcs here in a minute. And you can see just how slight difference there is. Yep, just showing off those gun arcs. You know, they're, they're pretty dang good overall. And torpedo arcs any moment now. <laughs> oh, you'd think I would remember when I actually press those buttons, wouldn't you? Well, we're going to continue over into these islands. And like I said, the, the vast majority of the reason for that is it allows you to break line of sight. It allows you to have hard cover, helps avoid taking just gobs upon gobs upon gobs of damage. Well, maybe we aren't going to show the torpedo arcs. I'm sure later in the match we will show them, so I'll be sure to point them out. And so far, we've been abandoned by our destroyer. Already off to a fantastic start. <laughs> uh, nothing like getting your heart racing like being the lead ship to go and receive enemy incoming fire. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, on the upside, Mr. Kutusov, yeah, we missed him. Mostly, the reason why we missed him is because, you know, dispersion, but he turned away at the last minute, and that's what caused that. Miyoko. Miyoko's over here. Oop. <laughs> Lucky slam on the brakes there to avoid the impending cheeky breaky doom. Somehow managed to miss Miyoko. And yeah. Where what did our Shiratsuyu do? I don't I honestly don't know what's going on here. Well started the Miyoko on fire. And we're trying to get back behind this island just far enough off of it to uh actually safely shoot at him and get some shells over top of it not quite there we did manage to get undetected though and this miyoko is already backing up well he's kind of in the same situation i'm in the only problem is we don't want to back up too much further but yes we got one lone shell through and it missed <laughs> dang it <laughs> well all right I guess we'll just go and we'll get this over with. So we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and charge out of here. Oop, he's turning. So we're gonna switch to AP. This is where the uh, reload skill comes in handy. And oh yes, 
Well, we're going to shoot even though it says we weren't available to, and we citadeled him twice and managed to get the kill. Now, we do have to worry about Mr. Kutusov. We also have the Iowa that's over there, but for the most part, it looks like the enemy forces over here are routing, which means they are running away. Although we do need to be cognizant of the fact that this Amagi is here, and in true fashion, we are going to chase him down. Well, at least partially chase him down, and punish him for not allowing number 301 to actually get a whole name. No, I'm just kidding. This, uh, the battlecruiser Amagi has absolutely nothing to do with the later Unryu class aircraft carriers that were being built that also bore the same names. So no, no reason to get those two confused, although it is kind of fun to think about. Uh, same turret arcs facing the forward as, uh, as uh, Mogami, but, well... It is what it is. I mean, it, there are far worse arcs in the game, especially on the forward-facing ones. 2k in damage there, and he disappears. So rude of him to disappear. The one thing that is really frustrating about this ship is just the, the level of micromanaging you have to do when it comes to ships on all sides. Oh, hi there, Kaga. Well... Uh, you, you, you really, really, really need to pay attention. Oh, hey, Mahan. Well, there's the torpedo arcs for those who are curious and wondering. Our guns are definitely in the wrong location, but we're going to still launch torpedoes just in case he decides to turn at the last minute. You can see our guns are already almost back onto him, so not a huge problem. And he happens to be turning the other way, which means there's a possibility we could hit him with. Oh, yep. There goes half my hit points. So that was uh, that long-range plunging fire that I was talking about in the earlier part of this video. Basically, if the enemy battleship wants to citadel you in the ship, you're going to get citadel. <sighs> yep, that that's that's by far one of the worst parts of this ship. It, it, it's the same problem. Oh, we got incoming fire from a Magi over there too. Yeah, he managed to take a decent chunk off, but. Uh, that one's going to miss. Pro tip, if you're looking to hit the carrier, you should probably, uh, you know, actually aim at said carrier. <laughs> Don't just blind fire at him all willy-nilly. So we've got our defensive fire is up. You can see we've shot down four or five of the strike aircraft. We've killed off all of the Kaga's dive bombers there. Switching it over to the... Uh, torpedo bombers, although I really don't know that it's going to matter a whole lot. Our fighter is going to make an appearance and going to help us shoot down three of his fighters. We we're up to 35,405 damage, and we've basically got this Kaga dead to rights. This is one of the few advantages of that range module. Basically, once you pin somebody into the corner of a map like this, it's very hard for them to get away. And... The ship is laced with napalm, lacing its shells with napalm, so you can guarantee that fires are going to start, like that one. We also did 5k, and you can see I'm maneuvering here to try and expose those rear guns to bring them into this fight. Don't have to worry about Amagi or any, any incoming fire, so we'll just go ahead and keep turning. And there's a second fire. Well, Kaga, you're th there's a third fire. It's not my fire, but there is a third fire. Oi! That's uncomfortable. That's like, oh, he repaired it. I was gonna say, I bet he was waiting for that repair to come back up. Unfortunately for him, there's two more. <laughs> uh, yep. So napalm. <laughs> I think we're we're pretty much guaranteed to finish off Kaga here. I don't think we need to worry too much more about this. But up oh, 3k. He's down to 1k. Six, and he's sunk. And we get an arsonist achievement out of this whole ordeal. Not quite in range of the Amagi, so we need to start finding other targets. Now, the key here for me was to get out from behind this island so that we can get a little bit closer to the other ships that are out there. Now, sure, I could stay all the way in the back here, risk zero on getting spotted, but we need to, we need to be, you know paying attention to what's going on on the map. We have a Missouri that is about to basically commit seppuku and kill himself, and um, that makes me really unhappy. It's okay, though. We will survive. <laughs> we just lost our Belfast. 
And about to lose that Missouri, unfortunately. But now we've got ourselves some other targets that are finally within range. Now this Iowa is backing up. So I don't know why I, I led ahead of him, but I did. <laughs> Whatever. All right. So we got a couple of options here. So long as that Amagi is spotting us, that, that leaves us open to incoming fire from, like, that Missouri, as well as the Kutusov. And all of that is bad. But thankfully, he ends up dying to our Missouri. So that means that we now basically can engage from relative impunity. The only thing that's going to cause us to be spotted here is going to be aircraft. Now they are all the way up at our cap. We are capping them out. So it's, it's a matter of time here. We'll just continue to hide behind this island as best we can until we get spotted and then we're gonna need to move right away. And hopefully we can get some fires on this Iowa and rack up a little bit more damage. We are up to 72,707, and we just bumped up to 74,885. Still shooting away. U.S. battleships are really, really, really easy to get high amounts of penetrating damage on when it comes to both fire, or, sorry, HE and AP pens especially when they're broadside, but I'm trying to get him on fire and get him get the fire stuck on him so that we can uh, switch to AP. And the AP will definitely do more damage over a, you know, shorter amount of time. He disappears. Yay. Well, I guess we'll switch to Mr. Kutusov over here. See if we can't maybe assist in the reduction of him to a smoldering pile of nothing. Maybe we'll get lucky and get a detonation. I doubt it. Yeah, especially not with aim like that. Not really sure what went on there with the aim on that, but it wasn't good. So we're not going to claim that. We do have our Iowa buddy that popped back up. Oi. <laughs> ah, that's why I switched to AP because the Katusov is broadside. Aha. Well, maybe we'll get lucky and kill him. I don't think so. Looking good? Nope. Right over top of him. Ah. Well, okay. So maybe we can get a last parting shot out on this Iowa before we go behind the islands here and can't engage anymore. We'll get to see a decent amount of how much damage the AP will do. Even at longer ranges, the AP is still pretty good. It's not as good as the German AP is. It's definitely not as good as the US AP is, but nearly four grand with five pens. That's not too shabby, in my opinion. I, I, I will definitely not complain about that. Up to 83,663 damage, and there's no way we're getting a Kraken, so anybody that's asking about thinking that I'm going to pull off some massive recovery here, eh, not so much. Remember, my opinion of this ship is marginal improvement over Mogami. Not a big improvement. Still shooting at him from behind the islands here. I think the torpedoes are probably going to be the end of him. If they're not, he's certainly going to burn to death. Oop. Oh, hey, we got the kill on that. That was the final kill. So we got three kills out of this whole ordeal. And 84,981. Those three kills. An arsonist. First blood. We got 1,383 base XP, real low XP game. Not a whole lot of capping, not a whole lot of spotting going on. And there's a credits and XP screen. Overall, just really not a, a huge fan of this ship. I mean, it's, it's better than Mogami is, but at the end of the day, I still feel like the ship is distinctly average, like it's lacking in some areas to really make it stand out. Maybe that's just the way I've been playing it. I plan on keeping it around just a little bit longer so that I can mess around with it. Anyway, I'm your Peacekeeper. Like, comment, subscribe, and thank you for watching.